We found the sweet spot. If you're in the back, at certain times, it's like you can't, you can hardly see the screen.
Good morning, saints. How is it with your souls this fine day? Welcome to worship this fourth Sunday in Advent. A few announcements as we start off. Everybody's welcome to sing on Christmas Day in, a, in the choir. Talk to Doug. Song's easy. We'll practice at 8.30. 8.30 next Sunday. Christmas Eve service at 5.30 candle lighting, so if you like fire, and <laughs> Sunday morning, worship will be at the regular time, 9 o'clock in the morning. There will be special activity for families with children. We won't have faith formation on Christmas Day, but we'll have activities that you can play in the pews with the kids, so, and we'll do the same thing on New Year's Day. Um... I have one more announcement, but anything else that you want to announce? Okay, so I hope everybody's planning on staying because today we're celebrating Carol after worship with a, a reception for her retirement. And um, she keeps telling everyone, which is true, I believe her, she's not leaving, but she's transitioning <laughs> to a different... Um, connection with the congregation as a, as a member who can do anything she wants because she doesn't have to work, right? <laughs> so, very good, very good. Anything else you'd like to announce as we begin? Okay then, friends, this is the Sunday before the Sunday, so let's sing with gusto. Would you um, stand? Let's sing Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
may be seated. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, as high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. God, God wants us to know, even when we aren't sure ourselves, God wants us to experience God's presence, even when we think we can handle life on our own. God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Jesus awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today of presence that speaks of love, as a sign that no matter our circumstance, we know that we are not alone. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Please join us with the call to worship from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Stir up your might and come and save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you feed us with the bread of tears? Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Turn again, O God of hosts, have regard for your vine. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O God, let us be saved. Please join us in the uh, first hymn, What Child Is This? And it's in the blue hymn note number 219.
Please join me for the opening prayer. Holy One, you send us new life in more ways than we can imagine. Open our minds that we may recognize it. Open our hearts that we may receive it. Open our bodies that we may embrace it. Open our souls that we may live it. Open us this day and all days. In Christ we pray, amen. The first of our scripture readings from the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The sec second scripture reading is from the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The second Old Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and he named him Jesus. Thanks be to God. If you have any prayer requests, I'll pick them up now, and uh, it's, on, it's at the bottom of the sheet of paper you were given this morning. Would you join with me in prayer? Thank you. 
Gracious God, as we anticipate with joy the renewal of your presence in the gift of your Son, Jesus, dwell in us richly. Help us, as we have heard these readings, to take them to heart and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You remember a few weeks ago when I said, somebody had asked me what I thought of the Bible, and I said, the Bible is, at least in part for me, an adventure. Because every time you open it, every time you look at a text, you may have read it 100 times or 500 times, and then something pops, and you think, I never thought of it that way before. And we, of course, are all helpers to one another in that because the Spirit speaks to and through all of us through the gift of this word. And it is good, yes? And so it is with this story of Joseph. I mean, routine, right? Joseph is a righteous man. Mary's pregnant. By the way, you notice that Mary says nothing and Joseph says nothing in this story. Thank you, Steve. But of course, Mary's prominent in the background. Can't forget that. And there's nothing here about an angel appearing to Mary. Nothing in here about her going to Elizabeth. That's Luke's story. Matthew has a different story to tell. It's the same story, but... He has a different story to tell. And we just think, well, we know this, right? You know, um, seems pretty straightforward. Mary gets pregnant, creates quandary for Joseph, who is her betrothed. Joseph has to make up his mind what he does. Angel appears, magic. Joseph does what the angel asks, and the story continues, right? Except for one thing. Before the angel appears, Joseph has already made up his mind to take a different path than the one that his faith and his culture prescribes for him to do. And it's important to what's happening in the story. You see, we all know, right, we've heard this a million times, especially around the Christmas season, that in the culture of Jesus' day, once people were betrothed to one another, legally, both legally, you know, by civil law and legally by religious law, they were already considered to be married. It's just that in the Jewish culture, the final step had not been taken, that until the actual ceremony when the husband takes his betrothed, his wife, to live with him in his household until that happens, right? It's not complete, but, but they're still considered to be married. And so, because of that, this part we kind of know, right? Her becoming pregnant before they're married is considered adultery because they're not supposed to, you know, do that before they get married. And in, adult in his time, in Jesus' time, and prior to that, the law is very specific about what happens when adulterers are caught. They are to be stoned to death the death penalty. Now, by the time we get to Jesus' birth, the rabbis have mitigated this somewhat, but the penalty for adultery was a process that was both widely public and crushingly humiliating for the person accused. And of course, in this case, you know, eventually, they would have their proof. We'll put air quotes around that. So Joseph is a righteous man, which means 
He follows the law in order to be in right relationship with God and with people. And he knows what he is supposed to do. We're not practicing the death penalty, but in order to maintain his qualifications, if you will, as a righteous man, he would then need to subject Mary to that process in his community that was both broadly public and crushingly humiliating. She would have to be cast off and hopefully her family might make space for her and take her back, but that was not guaranteed. And so before this dream happens, before this appearance of the angel comes to Joseph, he has already made a different choice that is not a choice that is given for the righteous. He chooses compassion. She's still going to suffer the consequences. We'll put air quotes around that too, right? We know how this story turns out. But he is not going to do it publicly. He's just going to let her quietly go back to her family, and as quietly as he could do it, he's going to sever the legal relationship. Now, we don't know how possible that was in his culture, but he has already made up his mind to do something that is not considered to be a faithful choice. He cares about Mary and about what happens to her, so he's going to try to mitigate the damage that this will do to her. Isn't this interesting? And it is at this point that the angel appears to Joseph. The angel doesn't change Joseph's mind necessarily about the path he's on, but gives him another option that extends a choice he has already made. To show care for Mary. You see, I think this is important because it suggests to us an openness of spirit in Joseph to another way, a better way, that to him may not count, and to others does not count as fulfillment of the letter of the law but provides a moral way, a loving way, of addressing a problem that has arisen. He's finding a different path than what is prescribed for him. And the angel effectively says, here's the thing, Joseph. Not only have you chosen a better way, but let me show you even better than that. Here's what needs to happen, because you see, Mary's pregnancy is a sign of God at work. So take her as your wife. Do not be afraid to do that. And when the child is born. Name him Jesus. This is critical, this naming of him as Jesus. So, a couple important things. Symbolically important because Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua, which means God helps or God saves. Lots of kids were named Jesus <laughs> during Jesus' time. But the name is important, and the fact that Joseph does the naming is critical because Joseph is from the line of inheritance of Moses. And by naming Jesus, he claims the child as his own, 
and gives him his lineage. And Joseph may not know the whys about this now, but what he does is he grounds this child who is born, this thing that God is doing, that he probably doesn't fully understand, in the tradition of the faith. He is the successor to Moses and the fulfillment of the law. It's an important thing for Matthew, right? He also ties it to another story, Matthew does, which is the passage that Steve read for us from Isaiah. And that story comes from a totally different time and a totally different place, and Matthew takes that story as his own to explain what God is doing here. You see, Ahaz is king of Judah. Hmm? And he's having all kinds of international troubles with the kingdoms to the north, Israel, which has broken away from the southern kingdom by that point, and Syria. And they have pretty strong armies, and they are constantly threatening Israel. And Isaiah goes to Ahaz and says, here, put God to the test. He's a prophet, so this is a word from the, from the Lord. Put God to the test and see that there is a sign in front of you. There is a woman who is already pregnant who's going to bear a child. And before the child reaches two years old, this will all be resolved. So trust in the Lord. And Ahaz makes a choice that is very different from Joseph's. He trusts in himself instead of what the prophet is telling him. And he uses a religious excuse. Don't you love this? This is where it gets personal, unfortunately. <laughs> he throws up that thou shalt not put the Lord to the test. You remember that phrase Jesus said from the Old Testament, from his scriptures, that he said it is temptation. Thou shalt not put the Lord to the test. And Ahaz throws that up in the prophet's face. And so the prophet says, here's the deal. God was willing to be tested on this. And because of that, Ahaz, you have failed the test. And what you fear is going to take place. You're going to be overrun by the king of Assyria. But in the midst of this is the promise that a child will be born as a sign. Now, this was part of Israel's faith throughout. I mean, Hosea had children and named them symbolically as signs for what God was doing in the midst of the people of Israel. So this sign of hope, God is with us, or God with us, which is what Emmanuel means, direct translation, God with us, was the promise that God would send a sign to the people that regardless of what was going to happen, there was hope because God was not going to leave them ever. Right? And that was a promise for a specific time, a specific place, a specific child. But we all know what Matthew does with this, right? He takes this verse and he says, here's the thing. Remember this promise from old? Now it applies to this child, this time, this place, therefore, all times and all places. Matthew takes the scripture of his people, Jewish Christians, and says, this is the sign, it's not just a sign, but the sign, capital letters, that God is with us and will never leave. We will never be abandoned again. 
So in this simple story of the angel's conversation with Joseph, we see revealed what is before us. That in this one who is to be born, God helps, God saves. The law is fulfilled, the prophets are fulfilled for once and for all time. That is what's going on here, Joseph says the angel. We can all assume, can't we, fairly, <laughs> that Joseph really doesn't have a complete clue as to what this means. Who could? But he takes it to heart, and the heart that was open in compassion for Mary, that perhaps the angel noticed and gave the angel space to enter in and say, let's take this even further, Joseph, because God is not only doing a different way, but a better way. Right? And he lays out, Matthew does before us, the whole path of discipleship in the person of this one man who is the betrothed of Mary. This week, I was parked at one of the courtesy tables at the car dealer while my car had its wellness check. And I was sitting next to a couple of gentlemen that were already deep in conversation with each other when I arrived, and, and I didn't want to interrupt them, but I interrupted them to say, can I sit here? <laughs> I don't want to interrupt your conversation. They're like, no, 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 come in. And time being what it is, while you're waiting for things to happen, we got engaged in just a discussion. It was very interesting listening to what they were talking about, and then one of them asked me a question, and you know what goes from there. And it turns out that one of the gentlemen is a recovering addict who is now a leader in a renewal um, support group addiction recovery program and has been for many years. And the other is a retired pastor of another flavor than United Methodist. Hmm? And eventually they asked me, what do you do? And I told them, and he says, what variety are you? And I said, United Methodist. And, and he said, well, I'm Lutheran. I said, which variety of Lutheran are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a legitimate question. And, I said, and he said, oh, not many people ask me that. I said, well, I do sort of speak Lutheran. We're cousins, <laughs> you know, have a lot of Lutheran friends. But what ensued was a conversation just part of it getting acquainted, but also just about what's happening in the world. And it turns out that this Lutheran pastor served as a missionary for a couple of years in Ukraine at the turn of the century. And we talked about that for a little bit. And one of the things that he said was that he decided to retire when, you remember this, this was a year ago. Remember we were all wearing masks? And he said, I really wanted people to be safe, but it wasn't politically correct in my congregation, and I decided it was easier to retire than to fight with them. And that led into a conversation about making the difficulty of making connections with other people, particularly in a fraught environment where every little thing can become an escalated war verbally or emotionally otherwise. Right? In fact, there was a really cool cartoon in the newspaper this morning. It's part of my preferred Sunday morning reading. You know, it gets my mind loosened up. And um, it was, the whole thing was about protocol for Christmas dinner. Um, and one of the guys said, okay, everybody, welcome to Christmas dinner. I just want you to know I've installed um, something new in my house, and it's called Tube Away. And if anybody brings up politics, it will suck you out of the house. <laughs> so, anyway, for the extent that see, it's so good to laugh about it, right? <laughs> but, 
But, you know, this pastor said to me, he said, you know, I know that if we wanted to, we could have all kinds of disagreements even around this table. But I've always felt, he said, that the invitation to us as people of faith is to pave a different way, is to do the different thing, perhaps to do the Joseph thing, which is to follow the path of love, openness to the word of God, the word of the spirit, the word of the angel coming to him, and openness to doing something new because that is what God asks us to do. Hmm? Bringing Jesus into the world was not something that was predicted by this and this and this and this and so therefore inevitable. God's advent into the world was a gift to show the world a better way, a better path, a path of love that goes beyond the law and the mere requirements of faith and righteousness to a higher righteousness that leads him to say multiple times to his disciples, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and then he calls them not to disregard what they know, but to go one step further. And so around that table at the car dealer, we talked about the work of our generation and the next generation and the next generation of people who claim the faith of Christ being this, to trust that this new path, this different path, this broader path, this path of love and compassion toward one another and toward the world is exactly the way that God will heal and save the world. We have the Ahaz choice as one of our options, which is to claim faith and go our own way. But here we have before us, in Joseph, the first one who says, I will listen and I will follow. Thanks be to God. Amen. For our prayer hymn, our first one this morning, let's sing together away in a manger. <clears throat> In these moments of quiet and in anticipation of your coming, O oh Lord, 
Remind us that you are always with us, that like Joseph, we might always be eager to fulfill your will and be eager to pray. O oh God, in days to come, the mountain of your house will be established and your joy for shall reign. We pray for your church everywhere, that you might teach us your ways and that we might walk in your paths. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayer. Out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and you, O God, shall judge between the nations. We pray for our nation and all nations, especially nations who are suffering and at war, for the people of Ukraine particularly, and all their allies. We pray that your peace would be manifest in every corner of the earth. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayer. <coughs> In your kingdom, O oh Lord, wolves lie down with lambs and children's play with serpents without fear. We pray this day for the sick and the suffering, those who are in distress of any kind. We pray for the lonely, those who are impacted by the cold and winter storms, those who are suffering hardship this season. We pray for Joni Wrench's family on the death of her uncle, we pray for those who are traveling this season and especially for Abel as she travels to Texas this week. We pray, O oh God, that you would heal all injuries, comfort all grief, settle all wrongs. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayers. In your kingdom, O oh Lord, even the wilderness and the dry land are glad and rejoice. We pray for those who rejoice this week gathering to celebrate the birth of our Savior, having time with family and friends. We rejoice with the wrenches as they celebrate their 40th anniversary this day. We celebrate Carol, all her ministry to this congregation, and pray for her in her transition so that she can be in ministry to you in other ways. We pray for all these and all other things that are on our hearts that in everything there would be joy and gladness and that sorrow and sighing might flee away. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayer. In the fullness of time, O God, you sent your Son to be born of our sister Mary. His name was Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for all the blessings that you give us every day. And we pray that you might be always present with those whom we love but see no longer. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayers. O Christ, hear our prayers and restore us. Show us the glorious light of your countenance that we might be saved. Come, Lord Jesus, and hear our prayers. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of O Little Town of Bethlehem, I invite you to give yourselves and your gifts to God through your tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have restored us in body and in soul and given us abundant life. You have made your face shine upon us and made us whole. Holy One, bless now the offerings of our hearts and lives that we might shine as you shine and share your abundant life with others. Amen. Our closing carol is Once in Royal David City. It's number 250 in the blue hymnal. I invite you to stand as you're able to sing. Brother Warren, remind me he has an announcement he'd like to make. If you would please uh, thank the staff. Yes, we've got the gift bags on the tables in the back, and this will be our last week collecting for that. Uh, you can still bring it into the office anytime during the week when they're open for business hours. And uh, please just remember all the staff and everybody who keeps the church running behind the scenes and works so hard for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, my friends. Let our prayer this week be, come Lord Jesus, yes? And in the hope and anticipation of his renewal in our lives, let us go forth in peace and confidence and joy, loving and serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.